Hi everyone, Terrible Dactyl here and welcome to Jurassic Plastic. Today I wanted to take a look at one of my favorite Carnegie Collection models of all time. This is the absolutely stunning 2011 Miragaya. Now, as you know, I'm a big Stegosaur fan, and uh, Miragaya is definitely one of the most unique Stegosaurs uh, available out there. Uh, as far as I know, um, only a handful of companies uh, have so far done uh, models of Miragaya. Um, obviously Carnegie being one of them and also Collect Day. Um, but I thought uh, today would be a good uh, week to uh, do a quick review of Miragaya in light of some new uh, discoveries and information that have come out recently about not only this species, but also the entire group of uh, Dacentrurine, uh, the Dacentrurine subgroup of Stegosaurids. So to start with, obviously Miragaya is uh, famous for being a log-necked stegosaur. Uh, it, it was originally found in Portugal, and up until this year it was only known from one specimen representing really just the front half of the skeleton. And the back of the skeleton in this reconstruction and most reconstructions that are out there has been filled in based on a presumed close relative, which is uh, the stegosaur Dacentrurus. And that's where we get these lovely... Um, spikes, which kind of give way to the more traditional plates, although they're relatively small plates up here in the front on Miragaya, but the rest of the animal is really informed more by Dacentrurus. Miragaya and Dacentrurus, really, the original specimens had very little, if any, overlapping material, meaning the Miragaya bones were not duplicates. They did not represent any of the same bones that we had from Dacentrurus. So this question has been hanging in the air of whether or not Miragaya and Dacentrurus are in fact the same species. Now as for Dacentrurus, not a lot of companies have ha tackled that species either, but I did bring out here uh, my Batat Terra sample of Dacentrurus just so you can get that kind of contrasting view of um, these two different animals. Now obviously these look quite a bit different in terms of proportions with Dacentrurus here being given a short neck, um, these shoulder spikes, um, and uh, stockier limbs, I guess. But um, other than that, you know, if these did turn out to be the same creature, Miragaya would probably, we would assume, be a closer analog for the correct appearance of Dacentrurus. So the new paper that I mentioned earlier is by Costa and Matias, and it describes a second specimen of Miragaya, also from Portugal, that really fills in some of those blanks and allows us to better compare it to Dacentrurus. Um, this paper also synonymizes uh, Alcovisaurus longispinus, um, which is known from Wyoming, as a species of Miragaya. So if we put all these specimens together, it's going to allow us to have a better reconstruction of the of the plate and spike arrangement. So what I want to do today is not only um, review the Carnegie Miragaya, but also talk about how this holds up in light of these new discoveries. One of the characteristics that we now know is representative of Miragaya is um, these thin neck plates. Now obviously the neck plates on this model are not super thin. They're a little bit on the thick side, but if you actually look at them, you can see that they are actually indented on one side. They're a little bit uh, concave on this side and convex on the other side. In older reconstructions of Miragaya, these plates uh, apparently, according to the paper, were actually flipped. Um, but Carnegie, uh, I'm not sure if they had a, other information or newer information when they were reconstructing this or what, but Forrest Rogers really did a good job with the plates because as far as I can tell from that new Costa and Mateus paper, uh, these plates are perfectly accurate in terms of the fact that the concave surface is actually pointed towards the outside uh, of the animal. Apparently a lot of reconstructions get that wrong and have them flipped. The back plates, as you can see here, are thinner and taller, um, just as they should be, um, and they are sort of transitional in form between um, plates and spikes. So you can see it kind of grades from these small rounded plates all the way up here to uh, more Kentrosaurus style spikes along the back and the tail. Now included in the material of Miragaya were these large spikes with a wide base. And Costa and Mateus argue that these would have been uh, over the hip 
um, probably pointed slightly out and backwards, just as they are here on the Carnegie model. Um, some people have said that they should be placed closer to the tail. Um, however, the tail, as we're going to talk about in a minute, is a little bit too narrow to support those. There was also speculation that these could represent um, shoulder spikes, and those have been reconstructed for Dasentrurus as well, as you can see on the Batat model. Uh, however, Costa and Mateus pointed out in their paper that any shoulder spikes really uh, would look quite different from the back spikes. The bases of the plates on the, I'm sorry, the bases of the spikes on the shoulder would be broad and flat, not curved like the ones that we find um, from Miragaya and in fact Dasentrurus as well. So probably the shoulder spikes on this model are an inaccuracy and Carnegie did get that right by omitting shoulder spikes. I believe the Collect Day version also does have the uh, what we now understand to be inaccurate shoulder spikes. Based on both Miragaya specimens and uh, Alcovasaurus longispinus specimens, we know that it did have these really long, thin, um, small based spikes, which probably belong to the Thagomizer at the end of the tail. And this is once again something that the Carnegie model gets right. So we've got these broader based spikes on the tail getting shorter and shorter and then these really long thin ones although I don't think they would necessarily be this curved I think they'd be a little bit thinner and longer um, but hey it really does have those two pairs uh, sort of like a stegosaurus of long thagomizer spikes which once again the um, Dacentrurus I guess kind of has uh, but it's hard to tell they're not really differentiated from the other spikes in the Batat model now, one of the interesting things that was pointed out in the new paper is that the last two-thirds of the tail of Miragaya were incredibly thin. They basically had no neural spines and no transverse processes. It was really just the centra of the vertebrae, which were very small and uh, really look a lot like the whiplash ends of a diplodocid tail. And that's one thing that... Um, that's one thing I can't fault the Carnegie model for getting wrong, because obviously this is a new discovery. But um, one thing that you could probably say is slightly inaccurate here is the fact that the tail just gently tapers um, rather than getting that really thin, um, flexible whiplash section, which would have been very, very highly flexible. And the base of the tail would probably be a lot beefier than this, um, supporting these very, very large muscles to really whip that uh, whiplash spiked tail around. It's interesting to compare the tail of Dacentrurians like Miragaya to Ankylosaurs. You know, Ankylosaurs kind of went in the opposite direction and really stiffened the end of the tail, making their tail club like a mace, whereas the tail of Dacentrurians was apparently more like a flail, like one of those, you know, a medieval weapon with uh, a stick and a chain attached to it, and then like, you know, a cluster of spikes at the end, which is kind of cool that this group of Thyreophorans went in that separate direction um, for a different type of weaponry. Now speaking of their tail weaponry, you've got to be able to have some solid uh, muscles to anchor yourself to the ground to effectively use this. And the Olacranon uh, process of the shoulder girdle was very, very large in Dacentrurians, especially in Miragaya, apparently much larger than other stegosaurs. And so that brings me to another slight inaccuracy of this Carnegie model, which is that it would have very, very beefy, thick um, deltoid muscles, which would go all the way down and sort of wrap around the uh, forelimb here and give it this really hefty, sturdy uh, anchor point, which Costa and Matias speculate would have been used to kind of like crouch down to the ground, anchor, anchor themselves while they pivot around with... Uh, you know, kicking up with the back legs in order to flail that tail around at predators. And I have seen speculation even that I thought was kind of interesting that the long necks in Dacentrurines, you know, if you think about it, this would allow them while they're doing that to turn around and really look at what they're actually swinging at as opposed to the, you know, short necks of some other stegosaurs. As I was saying earlier, the Miragaya is one of my absolute favorite Carnegie models. It really has just such a beautiful and subtle paint application. One of my favorite parts of this model, you know, aside from the beautiful red highlights and blue all along the head here, the really um, nicely sculpted face with the 
the beak that's just slightly opened, these nice little black details along the back, which are just so sharp looking. But I really, more than any of that, I like the subtle, subtle paint application. It brings me right back to the early days of the Carnegie Collection when we had nice, glossy, sculpture looking, um, not quite naturalistic, but more like a little piece of art um, type of animal models. And to highlight that, I just really love the yellow um, of the base plastic texture. You can see the three line belly stamp down there, which started uh, coming into use around 2011 or 2012. And just how that very subtly grades into these yellow green, mint green uh, sort of washes with a few different dabs of, of uh, peach coloration here and even just a very, very, very subtle blue-gray wash over the whole thing that brings it together. Uh, and between that and the multiple layers of wash that you've got on the plates, I think it's very hard to argue that this is not one of the nicest looking Carnegie models that Safari ever did. And you really have to hand it to the sculptor Forrest Rogers, who I believe also painted up the prototypes of these. Um, it's really just a spectacular figure. Um, Accuracy-wise, as we've been discussing, it's really uncanny how how they lucked out reconstructing an animal based on basically half a skeleton, and now we're getting um, new information that really just about supports almost every choice that they made when constructing this. And Forrest Rogers is really known for her beautiful uh, texturing detail, the skin wrinkles, and just the subtlest implication of scales without going out of her way to sculpt each and every scale, which sometimes kind of throws the the scale, pardon the pun there, uh, of the model off a little bit. Um, but uh, this, I should say this is a, a 125th scale model. If I take out my ruler here, you can see that it's about, if you were to measure along the vertebrae, 24 centimeters long. And um, that puts it at 125th, which is on the larger side. It scales well with um, some contemporary Carnegie models like the Carnotaurus, uh, and it does put it in a much larger size class than the 140 scale Batat Dacentrurus. So what is the bottom line? Well, turning back to the Batat Dacentrurus, um, I hate to say it because I really do like this model. Uh, the late, great Dan LaRusso did an amazing job um, sculpting and painting this one up. Uh, it's it's a really nice little stegosaur model, but uh, unfortunately, you know, the shoulder spikes really do decrease the accuracy. The short neck, as we now know, do decrease the accuracy of this figure. And uh, certain choices about the way that the plates grade into the spikes, um, but then the spikes kind of stay the same length all the way down. Um, are also probably inaccurate for this spe species. We should have a more defined thagomizer section here, not this sort of Kentrosaurus style tail. Um, the large beefy forelimbs are probably the one advantage that this does have over the Carnegie. The Carnegie's forelimbs are very, very gracile, and um, I think there would be a, a definite noticeable difference between just the musculature of those forelimbs in Dacenturians compared to the hind limbs, which were kind of gracile and, and probably did need to be agile in order to kick that tail around. Uh, the Carnegie Miragaya, despite coming out in 2011, um, is pretty much spot on accurate, except for those forelimbs. Um, the tail spine should probably be pointed. Um, outward a little bit more than they are. They're a little bit vertical here if you look at them from the top. I think they'd be angled out to the sides slightly more based on what I've been reading in Costa and Mateus' paper and other sources, but that's not really a, a huge error in my opinion. Now these are small nitpicks and I, I think that based on our current knowledge this Carnegie Miragaya is going to remain one of my favorite and possibly one of the more accurate Carnegie models for a while although I would really like to see one of the major companies go back and use all this new information, now put all these um, different specimens together and make the definitive uh, Dacenturian that can really stand on its own 
as a unique group of thyroid foreign dinosaurs alongside kentrosaurids and stegosaurines. Um, they really did have some really neat adaptations, and I would especially like to see one that does really good justice to that, what we now know as a, a really whip-like tail. I think that can make for some really cool poses on upcoming models. So uh, Safari, Collecte, PNSO, if you're listening, take a crack at Miragaya or even Alcovasaurus or Dacenturus, and let's see what we can do with a um, version of these in the 2020s. So that does it for my Miragaya review. Please make sure to hit that like button, subscribe to my videos, leave a comment, and I will see you next time on Jurassic Plastic. Music